How's it going, guys? You know, when it comes to buying and selling companies in real estate and doing it creatively the way that we teach with no money down, no credit checks, uh, all that stuff, I get a lot of questions. And over the years, I've heard many questions again and again. So today I'm going to address what is probably the most dangerous of these common questions. And once we go over this, you'll know to never fall into this trap again. You won't fall into the trap of thinking that this is a smart question. You'll always know that this is a stupid, stupid question. I'll tell you a story I heard as a child, a story about the devil and the lesson in this story that is the secret to making yourself immune from the quicksand mentality of the unaccomplished. And what we're going to talk about also is going to allow you to to, to read people a lot faster because once you know what to look for, you'll be able to pick out the best people, the artists that you want to build your team with, and you'll be able to screen them at lightning speed once you learn this and a whole lot more. So let's get started. Awesome mail here. You know, the single best way to talk anybody into doing anything is to make them talk themselves into it as if it was their idea. The more committed they become, the more your idea becomes their idea, as if it wasn't something external that you introduced them to, but rather is something internal that you reminded them of. Suggestions become ideas, ideas become beliefs, and over time, the source of those beliefs becomes less clear. The deeper a belief becomes, the more protective the mind becomes of it. The filter that you process new information through becomes more selective in order to confirm, not challenge, your existing beliefs. Any contradictions to your perspective are dismissed, minimized, or ignored. Your constructed reality builds on itself and is less dependent on what's really happening and more based on what you've already accepted and want as reality. This is how a whispered snowflake of suggestion turns into a mountain of manufactured truth. So my question to you is what snowflakes have you accepted and built into mountains? What you allow to influence you, the suggestions, the snowflakes that you choose to turn into mountains, this is a pretty important thing to consider. Maybe the most important thing. Because think about this. What if your influencer was something as dark as death? I'm not saying that you're under the influence of Satan, but if you were, would he want you to know about it? The beliefs that you have right now, they all started with a single grain of thought. But where did that come from? And it's an interesting question. It's something to think about. And there is a scientific name for this, by the way. We have a class that I recommend going through this. So this isn't, this shouldn't be, this isn't, or this shouldn't be the first time you've heard about neuroplasticity. It's the way that your brain reshapes itself based on what you think about. Your brain doesn't control your thoughts. Your thoughts control your brain. You enlarge what you focus on. What you think about the most doesn't just become dominant in your mind, but you'll see it illustrated in the world all around you, whether it's actually there or not. Train yourself, for example, to find opportunities or train yourself to find excuses. Either way, you'll succeed. And you know, while I'm talking about this, another really stupid question that comes up that people have often asked, especially real estate investors, is always, will this work in my area? Or sometimes I'll just flat out tell you, this won't work in my area. And what these people really want is they want an excuse. They don't really want to know if something applies to them or not. They just want a reason that it doesn't. Think about if I answered to the, if my answer to them was, yes, yes, this stuff does work. Yes, you know, whatever they're talking about does work in their area. Will they go out and make things happen immediately? No, of course not. And if they don't know me, they even may they may even say something like they don't believe me or they don't think that that's true. But that's not true. That's not their issue. Their issue is not that they don't believe me. Because if I was to tell them no, if I was to say no, that doesn't work in your area, they'll definitely believe that, right? So it's not an issue of trusting or believing. It's really an issue of them finding an excuse to validate their inaction. And that's what they really want. They just want an excuse. That's why as a policy, and I really shouldn't be telling you guys this, but as a policy, whatever Whenever anybody asks me or anybody on our team if something works in their area, we always say no. It doesn't matter where they are, what area they're talking about, or even if they haven't told us their area, it doesn't matter. We always say no. And you should see the reactions that you know, that we get. When, as soon as they hear this, they're like, oh, okay, well, I really wish it did because I was really looking forward. I was really excited and looking forward to doing this stuff. And it's so funny because they're so eager to throw in the towel. You know, it's so easy to stultify all their ambition. And, and we'll come back to this in a second, but that's not today's question. Let's get, it is kind of a version of today's question. So let's get back to the main question that I'm going to talk about today. Because like I said, over the years, people have asked me a lot of questions. Some of these questions come up again and again. And today, our question for today is one that has come up again and again. And I wanted to answer it in such a way that would benefit those of you that may not have asked this, or this may not be on your mind. Because although it is one of the most dangerous questions, it's also, you know, it might be one of the worst questions ever. And not just because of the question itself, but because of the mentality behind it. Because in reality, when people even think about asking this, let alone actually asking it, as soon as it's on your your mind, as soon as you've thought about it, you've already answered it. And this is the reason, today's question, today's lesson is the reason why the progress that most people make with their company, why most people only take their business, real estate or otherwise, about as far as, you know, you can kick a balloon against the wind. This is why people have so many problems. So here's the situation. Let's say that you're an average person with an average income at an average job, or maybe you're above average, or maybe you're already in business. The bottom line, that that doesn't really matter. The bottom line is that for over nine out of 10 people, like 99 out of 100 people, more than 99 out of 100 people, it's 
not just that you're not happy with your income, but you will not make a significant change to it. So wanting to make more money doesn't make you unique. Most people would just want to have more money. They just want it to appear. But the more ambitious people want to make more money. They want to go get it. They want to get rich and not be rich type of thing. So when you think about that world, the world of increasing your income on purpose, you really don't have many options outside of business. And since just about everybody is doing just about everything wrong, you pretty much have to change everything that you're doing. And most people don't do that. But even if you do, even if you do change and adjust everything you're doing, the real issue always comes down to this. You're in one of two groups. If you're trying to do this, if you're trying to increase your income on purpose and with skill, you're in one of two groups. You're either trained and you know what you're doing or you're just guessing. And I'll tell you, take a look at the numbers. This is why I spend so much time on this. Take a look at the numbers. Go over the facts. Go over the statistics. Look at the reality and you'll see that almost nobody has any idea what they're doing. And just, this is why also, you, by the way, you should go through our essay class, webuildempires.com. Go to the bottom, go to the application page and really study that essay class. You can download it and have it on your computer forever. And we really go into this in depth over what it, over what it takes to experience and to create a significant change in your financial situation. You've got to go through the essay class. A lot of great stuff there. And you'll see that this almost never happens. But when it does happen, when people do make a change, it's usually because they were carried to that destination. It's not a result of skill. Most people are just guessing. They're not skilled. They're not skilled and they're not trained. So it's natural in those, in that you know in that situation, in that environment, it's natural not to get the best result. And when that happens, you start down a path where a question comes up. And that's what today's class is all about. A simple three-word question that represents a path down to mediocrity, a question that is the beginning of the end. These words are the kiss of death. The question, I'll sum it up. Here it is. The question is, should I quit? Usually people will start talking about how hard they're working or how hard they've tried. And then they'll talk about the lack of supporters in their personal life, which makes sense because if you think about the opposite, it's not like somebody's going to say, oh, I just started in business or I just started real estate investing and everybody's behind me. So should I quit? That doesn't sound right. So it first starts with bad news. And the bad news is usually how hard they're working, how long they've been working, poor results, deteriorating support, how tired they are, how untalented they feel, or differences in their situation versus the situation of others who are succeeding, how much money these endeavors have cost them, and on and on and on. So here's an example of how this sounds. Awesome, I've been trying to get in real estate for over 10 years. I've worked really hard and spent thousands and tens of thousands of dollars and probably a lot more. I just don't even want to think about it. And I still haven't made a penny from any of this and my friends and family think I'm crazy and that I just need to get a regular job and start being normal. I've tried really hard to get this going, but I'm starting to think that maybe I don't have what it takes or maybe I should try something new or I should try working a new business or go to a new area where people are having more success in real estate. I don't know, but I can't keep going on like this. It would be a lot easier if the stress wasn't in my life. Should I just quit? And I just quoted you an actual question. Others ask the same thing too. And almost every time, they don't just say, should I quit? They add some or all of the ingredients I just talked about, right? The bad news, the lack of supporters. What they're really doing is they're justifying all the reasons why they should quit. It's why I said, one of the reasons I said they've already answered their own question. You see, their mind has been trained to focus on those issues. You see what I mean? Okay, so so here's the, here's the real answer to this question. This is the most brilliant answer on the topic if you're ready. Are you ready? I want to make sure you're in a seated position for this. You know, before I get into this anymore, let me just say that if you're even thinking about quitting, then you already have. Just the fact that it's on your mind means that you've accepted alternate results or another course of action or a course of inaction. Either way, once you get to a point where you're actually thinking about this, let alone when you've given this strand of doubt enough layers of reinforcement to verbalize it, at that point, you've already lost. But it's not too late. Together, you and I can fix it. And you know, for a while, I thought about this, how I should answer this, how, you know, I could give you a hundred different answers or examples from other students. But instead of doing that, I'm going to tell you, like I said, a story that I heard a long time ago. It has stayed with me. It has changed my life in so many ways. And I hope that even if it does a fraction of that for you, then you'll thank me forever. So this has a lesson. This story has a lesson. And it's been on my mind ever since I was a kid. And when I moved around, and when I grew up, I moved around, I've talked to you guys about this before, I moved around a whole lot. And I don't mean moving around just in America, but even abroad. I have a large extended family that's all over the place. So I've actually lived in Israel. I have an aunt who's in a strict Jewish family, and I've been to Jewish schools and synagogues. I've been to madrasas in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and temples in India. So I've been to like the schools that you see on the news, and I've also been to strict private Catholic schools here in the States. And by the way, while I'm talking about this, I know that sometimes disagreements or problems among people are exaggerated. So let me say this while we're talking about it. In my family, in my life, I have lived with and been around Jewish people, Hindus, Muslims, Christians. I've been in the countries and grown up around these people all my life. And I even have people from all different faiths and backgrounds in my family. And I can tell you that they're all great people. The disagreements or problems that people have are usually exaggerated by media to audiences and to a public that doesn't know any better. So they instantly accept these mischaracterizations. And this is done across the world. In every culture that I've been a part of, it's done because the people with influence 
influence and money have an agenda. They have something to gain by victimizing their audience and vilifying those that are different or don't agree with them. My point is that in places like America, we should be smarter than that. People are good. People are good. And not many people that you will ever talk to in your life have more experience with humanity than I do. And I can tell you, we can make things better, not worse. We are much more alike than different. The world has more love than hate. People are good. It's okay. I just want to make sure I said that. So when it comes to different cultures and backgrounds and religions and stuff like that, I got it from all angles. And a few of those things, not much, but some of that stuff actually stuck. And here is a story. And here is a lesson that my uncle taught me. So it's a story about the devil. Here it goes. One day, the most powerful demons in the world came to the devil and they said, you know, it's not fair that you get all the credit for the, all the evil in the world. We're just as good at causing evil as you. The only problem is that we don't have your tools. If we just had your tools, then we could be as strong as you, maybe even stronger than you. So why don't you give us your tools? Just give us some of your tools because you have all the tools. So just give us some of your tools, devil, just some of your tools. The devil looked at him and he scoffed. He said, leave me alone, demons. You don't know what you're talking about. The demons eventually left, but sometime later they came back with even more demons and they said the same thing. They said, we need your tools. If we just had your tools, we could beat you. Without them, this isn't a fair fight. Now this time the devil had a harder time dealing with the demons, but eventually he got rid of them. So some more time passed, but the devil knew that they would be back. But this time when the demons came back, it wasn't just some of the demons. It was all of the demons. All of the demons in the universe ambushed the devil. And this time they demanded the devil's tools. They said they would not leave until they got his tools. They said, the only reason you get credit for all the evil is because you have all the tools. We need your tools. Now this time the devil realized that he had a rebellion on his hands and sooner or later he had to deal with it. So he made a deal with the demons. He said, okay, I've been telling you that it's not about the tools, but if you want me to prove it to you, fine, I will. I'll lay out all my tools in front of you. You all can pick any tools that you want. You can take as many as you want and then we'll go out into the world and we'll see who causes the most evil. So that'll be the challenge. Now, after you've taken all of my tools and I'm left with not a single tool, if I still manage to beat you, then you have to agree to never ever rebel against me again. Don't ever challenge or question my authority again. Do we have a deal? The demons all smiled because they knew that if they got their hands on his tools, there's no way that they could lose. So they all agreed to the deal. And just like that, the devil took all his tools. He laid them out in front of all the demons. There were all his tools laid out there on a table. He said, this is every tool that I have. This is every way that I'm able to create evil in the world. Without these tools, there would be no evil anywhere in the universe. These are all the tools there are. These are all the tools of evil. Here they are. And stretched out on this table were the tools of gluttony, greed, pride, sloth, wrath, envy, lust, jealousy, murder, mayhem, chaos, rage, betrayal, seduction, deceit, thievery, bloodlust, corruption, rape, arrogance, bribery, destruction, hate, vengeance, torture, ignorance, all the sins, everything, all the evil in the world, all the tools were out there laid out on the table. All the devil's endless arsenal of tools were all laid out as far as the eye could see in any direction. Then he turned to the demons and he said, now take your pick, take as many as you want, take as few as you want, whatever you want, break them up, divide them among yourselves, however you want, do whatever you want. And as soon as he said that, the demons flooded the tools, they fought over the tools, arguing over who would get what, and the whole time the devil just stood back and waited. He just watched and waited. Eventually they were done, and the ranks of demons stood before the devil, armed to the teeth with all of his tools, except for one. And all the fighting over the tools, the demons had left one tool behind. There was one tool that nobody wanted. It was the smallest, it was the most worn out, it was the weakest of all the tools. The devil walked over, he picked it up, and he said, you all left this behind. Is this a tool that you're gonna leave me? Are you sure that nobody wants this one? They said, yeah, you can have that one, we don't need it. It's useless junk, so you can go ahead and keep that one tool. So one more time, the devil confirmed the deal. He said, okay, now you have all of my tools. Some of you have dozens, some of you have hundreds, but all of you have all of my tools. And now that you have them and you've left me with nothing but this one tool, now the challenge starts. We'll go out, we'll see who can create more evil. And if I win, remember, I'm never to be challenged again. That's the deal, right? The demon said, yes, but don't worry. There's no way that's going to happen. There's no way that you can win. But yes, if somehow you do win, then yes, we'll never dare to question your authority again. The demons all signed a contract. The devil snapped his finger. The contract just, you know, poofs away. It's recorded and it disappears. And then the devil started laughing. Started laughing louder and louder, like uncontrollable laughter. He looked at the demons and he said, you fools, you don't stand a chance. The demons looked at each other and said, well, why? Why do you say that? And that's when the demons learned who they were dealing with. The devil held up his tiny tool and he said, in my hands is the ultimate tool of evil. In fact, it's a required tool for evil and none of the other tools combined have any power without this one tool. And I knew that you demons would look past it. I knew that you would let me have it. I knew that you don't really understand how evil in humans works. Now the demons got closer and closer and they listened very carefully to the devil's words. The devil continued. He said, all these tools that you have, they only work on bad people. The problem you have is that people are not bad. People are good. So to create evil in the 
world. It won't happen by making bad people do bad things. It happens by making good people do bad things. We need to turn good people bad. The secret to spreading evil isn't to influence bad people, it's to create them. And this tool in my hands, in the war between good and evil, this is the most underestimated power that there is because only with it can evil live on. This tool is what allows a bad person to be born within a good one. This isn't just the only tool that you need, but it's the only one tool that allows room for any of your tools to work. The plummet that a person takes from good to bad isn't sudden or in the blink of an eye. It's a gradual descent that starts with a single unnoticed step. And it's important that that first movement towards evil is done covertly. Because if people knew the path they were starting on or the person they were about to become, then there's no way they would allow it to happen. But it must happen. In order for our work to carry on, it must happen. There aren't enough bad people in the world for evil to survive. We must recruit from the good. And the turn from good to bad has to be done in such a way that people don't even know it's happening. And that's what this tool does. This is how I'm able to speak into people's ears, to embed myself into their minds. Eventually, my suggestions become their orders. My plans become their goals. My words become their thoughts. And this all happens before they even know that we started talking. This tool is so small because I don't want it to be noticed. It's so worn down because I use it the most. And it's so weak because I need it to be accepted easily. And I have disguised this tool so well that even all of you demons were fooled into overlooking its importance. But without this tool, you are all powerless. Without this tool, even I would be powerless. This is the ultimate tool of tools. This is the tool of discouragement. And that's the big secret. Discouragement. So this is the end of the story. This is me, Ozum, talking to you. No, we're done, you know, talking about Satan. But that's the answer. The power of discouragement. You know, it's a story that I've always remembered. You know, this is a, this is a powerful thing. I've always remembered this. The, you know, the discouragement. Just the, the effect that it has. It's something I always remember. And any time that I've ever felt myself getting discouraged, I immediately work to improve my, you know, my autocorrect with it. And if you look at your situations in the past, the times in your life when you did things that you know that you're better than, when you think of them, you usually did those things because somewhere along the line, you allowed yourself to get discouraged. And make no mistake, by the way, getting discouraged is a choice. Getting discouraged is a choice. The moment you accept it, it's like a pact is made with the devil. You know, you're shaking hands with a chainsaw and you should treat it like you're talking to the devil because if you don't take aggressive steps to reshape the path you're on, then pretty soon you're thinking about quitting. Then you're wondering if you should and eventually not quitting seems crazy. This is why most people and most businesses are a graveyard of brilliance and potential. So many smart people live their lives carrying around the tumors of regret, the darkness of suffocated potential and the scars of lost dreams. And if you study this, you'll see the same pattern repeated again and again. Whenever somebody arrives at the destination of quitting, if you trace your finger back through their maze of decisions all the way back to the starting point, you'll see that the first turning point that leads down the path to quitting always starts with the choice to get discouraged. That is the moment when the seed is planted. So my answer to all the questions about quitting is more of a mirror than it is advice. If you're wondering whether or not you should quit, you've already decided to quit. You've decided to give less than your all. You've decided to make countless micro decisions based on this less than half-assed effort that you're willing to give. You've already decided hundreds or thousands of times at the very least to get discouraged. So my reply to anybody wondering if they should quit is what do you want? Do you want to quit? Yes or no? That's the answer. If you don't want to be a quitter, by the way, then it will rely on your ability to resist getting discouraged. So if you really want something, don't let that happen. Use your passion, resilience, and training to look at any potential setback as an opportunity to learn more and improve your approach. Grab opportunity by the hair. Minimize the negative and maximize the positive. In short, be the best version of yourself and only get involved with causes and businesses that mean enough to you that you will not allow anything other than your best foot forward. Keep in mind that the world won't miss what you never give it. So use my stuff and leverage your emotional capital by investing it in whatever model you do from now on. Once you do this, once you properly harness passion and emotion and leverage it with your skill that you get from our stuff, from our, from getting yourself trained, once you do this, you'll insulate yourself and become allergic to discouragement. And when you look back at your old self, you'll have the disbelief of a weight loss victor looking at a before picture. Get crazy. You know, the fact is that most people are very easily discouraged. That's why for most people, them don't do nothing. You know, it's the, it's the way it is. And the bottom line is that it's like I always tell folks. One of the most important policies that you'll ever develop is that from now on, when you start something, anything, whenever you start anything, from now on, this is with anything, from now on, when you start something, you do not stop until you get what you want. The number one reason people quit, if you trace that decision back, you know, follow that trail of breadcrumbs that led to failure, the first crack in the foundation always starts with getting discouraged. Now, we teach and invent a whole bunch of different models, and often people ask, which one should I pick? Which one should I start with? And the fact is, it makes 
makes no difference. Doesn't matter what you do, it matters how you do it. That's the difference. The difference is in how you do it. I'll give you another example of how when you understand this, when you understand the importance of discouragement, it can not only change your income, but change your life. One of the biggest secrets to growing any business or having any team of people perform dramatically better is something that we call normalizing the extreme. So in the 1800s, an Italian economist noticed that 80% of the food was being produced by 20% of the farmland. Then he noticed that this ratio, this 80-20 ratio was at work all around it. 20% of the people have 80% of the money. 20% of the businesses do 80% of all the commerce. His name was Vilfredo Pareto, and this principle is named after him. It's called the Pareto Principle, or the 80-20 Rule. That 80% of the results come from 20% of the exertions. And that was over 100 years ago. Gradually, that's become more like a 95-5 Rule. So if you look at America, for example, it's only 5% of the world, but we have 95% of all the money. And by the way, my stuff, we work with people from all over the world. It's not just for people in America, but usually, like people in Australia and the UK, those are places modeled after America. But it doesn't matter if you're in one of those places or, or another place. We work with people from all around the world. This stuff applies to anybody, no matter where you are in the world. The reason why I focus on America so much, in these classes at least, is because the folks in America, we really need to take our role in the world more seriously. For more on that, go to the SA class. You want to check that out. Now, um, the, so this 95-5 rule, think of a sales team. If 95% of all the results come from 5% of the people, what that also means is that within that 5%, 95% of those results come from only 5% of those people. And then within that 5%, 95% of those results come from just 5% of those people. So you look at any sales force or any business and it's just, you know, one person or just a handful of people can outperform hundreds or thousands. So the question is, what are those people doing? And what if you took their behaviors and you normalize them for everybody else in the company? Here's what I mean. Let's say, so, so let's say that a top sales guy makes 15 calls a day, for example, and the average person only makes three calls a day. Now the guy who's doing three calls, he knows that he can make more money if he made more calls, but the number one reason he doesn't do it is because, you know, they're getting discouraged. Now, if you create a new policy where everybody makes at least 20 to 25 phone calls a day, now the average guy who breaks records at 15 calls a day, he thinks he's ahead of the game. And this works especially well with new people because they never get used to making just three calls. Another example would be follow-up. So let's say that the best people follow up seven times and the average person follows up only twice. If you make it a policy to follow up 10 times, then when the average people get compliance after just seven follow-ups, they think they're ahead of the game. This is a powerful lesson. The same behavior that would have been discouraging now becomes encouraging. You see how this works? I'll give you another great example. One of my favorite students, Angela Meckel. She's a warlock, Angie X. She's been with us for years. She's a badass. And she took this same concept and went to a real estate broker and told him that she was in charge of conducting an experiment on discouragement. Just the name alone is pretty badass, right? So this test, this, this was going to be a test where she was going to take a group of real estate agents to, I think the first time it was like 250 or so. They were going to find out who the best performers are and who's responsible for that 80 to 95% of the results. And then within that group, within that group of the best, you want to get really targeted on the best of the best and get those policies from those best and get those best policies from that, that, that tiny group of elite performers. Then she interviewed other agents to find out what they were doing. So you're going to find interview normal agents, then really good agents, and then the best of the best to find out what the differences are. Now, if you think about that, that's over 250 interviews. Seems a little nuts. So what you could do is spend a lot of time with the best people and then with the normal people, just do a random sampling that represents the average. That's one way to do it, but that's not what she did. She had them all interviewed. How did she do it? Well, remember that this is an experiment, an experiment on discouragement and how it affects small business performance. In this case, specifically real estate agents. Now, when you frame your brilliance or our brilliance in that way, it opens the doors to wider options for your methods of execution. In this case, she worked with a local university and she allowed their psychology students to be a part of the experiment. So they were involved in the investigations. They conducted nearly all the interviews and they tracked all the results after the interviews were done. And the bottom line is that by introducing the policies of an elite performer to an average performer, a big difference was made, obviously. But there was several times the difference when these policies were introduced to new real estate agents who never grew accustomed to any other level of performance. And it was the university students who not only marketed and advertised and screened, but they also they were the ones who went and recruited new agents and then introduced to those new agents these policies of the elite. So a new agent would come in and they would immediately start, you know, they would follow those policies. They would send out their mailings. They made their appointments. They took the eight buyers out a day. They hired their team accordingly. They did everything, right? They did all the policies of the best. They followed all those policies and they did it much better because they never knew any better. They never trained themselves to be LCs, right? Now the money difference was in the millions. This little experiment proved that Angie could go to just about any broker and she could add millions to that business. She could make them millions more of dollars. Millions more of dollars. Millions is more of dollars. More. Millions more of dollars. Millions of dollars more. That's it. Okay. That's it. Now, she did make money on this deal.
deal. But let's say that you did this. Let's say that you set this up and you did it for free or you did it like a GXM, a Goodwill Experiments model. So you made no money on this. Let's say that you did that and you made no money on it. What could you do next? Are you following this here? Are you seeing all the options? Here is just one thing to consider. By working with the psych department at a local college, you aren't just leveraging your range of execution, but you're also getting a powerful endorsement, scientific backing that commands compliance. Think of it this way. Imagine going and talking to another broker and explaining to them, explaining to the broker that you just worked with, let's say, the University of Pennsylvania to study the effect of discouragement on real estate businesses and that you found there's a series of five pressure points that when fixed create an average of over six million dollars a month for the broker or for brokers like this or brokers of his size. Do you see where this is going? You see the kind of compliance you gain? You see what this does to your compliance gaining ability? And what does it take from the broker by the way? Nothing. And on your end eventually you can do all this over the phone if that and you can keep talking to brokers and you can keep taking the same model not just to brokers in your state or in your county but around the country and actually around the world. Now my students will recognize that this is the, the part of this at least is part of the MFM, the Manufactured Franchise Model. And of course, Angie made a killing on this, but right afterwards, another student of ours, Mike Premier, did the exact same thing. He did a discouragement study, an experiment on discouragement with a broker. He had local psych students take part in the investigations, and he took the results to other brokers. He spent about 60 days getting it all set up. You understand what we're doing here, right? How we're getting the results, and we're taking those results to other brokers, and then you're getting paid on the increase in business. And that increase of business, by the way, it is what the brokers are doing. You're introducing the policies, but they're the ones actually doing it. And how you're getting and disseminating the policies is actually, that's uh, with involvement of the psych students. I don't want to say that you don't have to do anything because you shouldn't look at it like stuff you have to do, it's stuff you get to do. But by positioning yourself, by building your skill and becoming a leader, you get to lead these different you know pockets of humanity to higher performance. It's amazing. It's amazing stuff. So what Mike did, he worked 60 days on getting this done. And I say worked, I should say that with quotes. He got this done over 60 days. And then after that, he took this around to different brokers. And for the next two and a half years, he made, and we just did the math together during our our, our interview, he made for the next two and a half years an average of over fifty thousand dollars a month, fifty grand a month. Think about that: working sixty days and then making over fifty grand a month for the next two and a half years from one model. And the brilliance—I mean, think of the brilliance of working with psych students. My goodness, it's brilliant. Do you know what I'm saying, man? Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, I think I'm getting off topic. I don't even know anymore. Don't let yourself get discouraged. That's the—that's the bottom line. Otherwise, you're gonna end up that guy or that woman at the bar, always talking about what you could have, should have, would have done. You're gonna shit all over yourself and won't make a difference. Discouragement will sneak and scheme, handcuff your dreams, choke its screams, make you think and believe that quitting's a sensible thing. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Okay, 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 we're good. Okay, okay. Now one of the things that I talk about, one of the things we talk a whole lot about is building your team in the right way. It's a major part of being an SA and by the way, if you haven't seen the SA class, go to it. Go to webuildempires.com, scroll all the way to the bottom and then go and watch the SA class. You'll thank me later. Maybe. I don't know. You should watch it though. Seriously. But you know, sometimes I'll hear somebody brag about how few people they have on their team or how they have no employees and how they pay their people pennies. And they say it like they're, you know, like they're so proud of it. Like they're proud that they are the only ones who make any money. Now, usually these are the people that are trying to sell you something. And in that case, I always tell people, I always ask folks, should you really buy into that? Do you want to build something where you are the only one that makes any money? Somebody, you know, when anybody brags about having something like that, they're telling you an awful lot about themselves. The only question is, are you listening? Think of it this way. What if Bill Gates had built Microsoft where he was the only person who ever made any money? And then he went around the world bragging about it, bragging about the fact that he's such a terrible leader, that his ideas and focus are so self-centered that the only person that he ever figured out how to make any money for was himself. What would you think of him? Would you want to learn how to do that? And I know a lot of people are in this mode and a lot of people who have huge overhead and it's killing them. So I know people on both sides and I'm not saying getting overhead. I'm not saying that adding employees and adding huge overhead is the answer, but building your team the correct way is absolutely the answer. Here's what I mean. For everybody that makes money, for anyone who has money coming to them, whether it's a uh, paycheck or dividends or whatever, if you have money coming to you, this, this applies to me, to you, to everybody. Anyone who has money coming to them, you're basically getting paid one of three ways. Your income comes from and is dependent on three things. Number one is what you're doing, right? This is like a job. You go and trade your time for money. This is where most people are and this is why most people go to school like college and they get a piece of paper that will convince somebody that their time is worth more money. If they stop working, the money stops coming in. And a lot of people in business, by the way, are in that same mode. But that's the first way. That's one way of getting paid. You get paid based on what you do. If you want money, you have to do something for it. If you stop doing that something, you stop making money. The second group is people who are paid based on what they did. This is like residuals or royalties. You know, I have a friend who knows Axl Rose and apparently he and Slash still make $400,000 a year or something crazy like that from Appetite for Destruction. That came out in the 80s. So a lot of celebrities get paid this way. You don't have to be a celebrity though. Although people that are in 
in this group usually understand that getting paid for who you are is better than getting paid for what you do. But even if you're not a celebrity, if you have a license or transaction agreement or money continues to come in from what you did in the past, it's the same thing. So that's number two, getting paid for what you did in the past, for what you already did. The third way is that you get paid based on what other people are doing. This is how the richest people in the world get paid. Now, if you think about those three groups, ask yourself where your money comes from right now. For the average person, actually for over 99% of the financially lost, most people, all their money comes from that first group. It comes from what they do. Their money comes in and is almost entirely dependent on what they get up and do. They get a lot less money based on what they did and they get almost no money from the efforts of others. Make sense? Now look at the other spectrum. Look at the richest people in the world and categorize them into these groups and what do we see? It's the exact opposite. They make almost all their money from group three. Most of their money comes in from what others are doing and then some of it comes in from what they've done in the past but then almost none of their money, none of their wealth, none of their income is dependent on what they're doing right now. You see what I'm saying? And when you build this correctly, you can spread opportunity to those around you. This is how Microsoft, they employed more millionaire receptionists than any other company in history. The people there who were just answering the phones were able to become millionaires. That's the mindset that you should be going into this with. Because what this tells you is that if you want to propel yourself into the group, into that group three, where the people you start making money the same way that the richest people in the world do, then one of the best things you'll ever learn how to do is to build your team correctly. How to become a leader of men, a leader of people. And when it comes to building your team, there's a lot of ways to do this without ever writing a check or ever coming out of pocket. But the main thing is that this is where your head should be, to build a team of people that become Terminators, that become SAs. You know, it's not like somebody goes out after 10 years and says, you know what, maybe I should figure out a way for other people to make money with my business. That's not how it works, because if you're lucky enough to know how to do it, then you're smart enough to do it from the start. It's like we always say, you should be emotionally invested and actually care about your business and the people you're trying to help. If you start a business that you don't care about, you're going to have a business that you don't care about. It's the same thing with your vision. You know, if you're so self-centered, if you start a business that if you start a business with a myopic focus, your business is going to run with a myopic focus. It's always going to be myopically focused. It's always going to be very short-sighted and self-serving. And what I, you know, and the reason I'm saying this, you know, I know a lot of you guys are now going through every single class, every short film, everything that's up right now. You're going through all the injections. You're going through all these pages. And so when I talk about, whenever you hear me talking about building your team, I really, I want you to really study that stuff and take it seriously. My friends and I have invented some really cool ways to do it. You could start totally from zero and you aren't going to be selling or convincing anybody that you know what you're doing or trying to convince them that you really are this genius. It's just the opposite. You want to help people see how much more of a genius they are than what they may be illustrating in their life right now. You want to start building your team and reaching that SA status. So when I talk about the team building stuff, this isn't hiring virtual assistants or getting people around you and then always looking for ways to pay them less and less and then bragging about it. No, it's just the opposite. You want to build Skynet, Terminators building Terminators. You always pay, you always hear people say that good help is so hard to find. No, it isn't. I do it every day. My team does it every day. Our students, clients, friends, we all do it every day. The question isn't how do you find good help? It's how do you provide good help? People should be able to come in and build an empire within yours. That's the type of environment you want to have. Now, do you have to do this? No, you can do what everyone else does and you can allow people to perform far less than where they're capable of. No problems. You can do that. Just like you can go camping during a forest fire. Don't make it a good idea. You know what I'm saying? And remember, if you just let one person in like that. If you let just one LC, if you let a single downer in your ranks, a single downer in your ranks, their energy is going to spread like an oil spill. And pretty soon you're going to have people telling you that this doesn't work in my area. Man, it just gets crazy. Don't do it. You know, people always ask me, you know, I have not just students and clients who like friends, people that know me personally, they always ask me, Awesome, how do you build a team of people that go out and make you rich? How can I get people around me that'll make me rich? And that's the exact wrong way to look at it. That's like the polar opposite of the way to look at it. It's not how do I get people around me they'll make me rich. It's how do I make the people around me get rich? You see the difference? Everybody's got brilliance. You just need to help light that fuse. Don't light a fire under people. Help them feed the fire that's already within them. People will always do more for you, more for themselves, and more for humanity at large and really just for the world in general. They will always do more because of who they are than what you pay them. Help them find their brilliance. This is a skill. And by the way, that's why when I talk to students, I always say that you need to make sure that you bring me that emotion. You need to have a business or some cause or something that you really really care about, that you are really invested in emotionally, because your passion is the driving force. When you come to me, bring me that drive and I'll get you the income you want. But you need to be a force that's not going to quit or let yourself get discouraged, right? You see what I'm saying? If you want to be a student, I'll tell you, I've just been flooded lately with a student request. And if you want to be a student, this is about the most important thing. Bring your emotion, your drive, your passion. It should be like a raging river. I want to direct the flow of the river. I don't want to be praying for rain. You know what I mean? That's you. If you're in that place where you really have a cause, something you want to shape the world, with, then you need to get to webuildempires.com and if and when applications have been accepted, be all over it. Okay, so what I was talking about with the team
team. The reason I mentioned this, the mention and all this with the team is because when you understand the power of discouragement, you can use it against your competitors. You can use it for yourself. You can use it to build your team. This is a very powerful component of how to build your team correctly. And you know, this is also a great way to qualify people on your team. One of the things I always recommend when you're thinking about interviewing someone or adding someone to your team is try to discourage them. If somebody calls you for an interview, say something like, you know, I plan on meeting some really great people and I'm not saying that the position is taken and we're still willing to, to interview uh, other people, but only if they're really going to impress us and blow us away. You know what I'm saying? And that's not going to be easy. So you tell me, what do you think? Should we even bother doing an interview? What am I doing when I talk like that? I'm trying to discourage them, right? The easier it is to discourage people, the less likely it is you should work with them. Strength is defined by resistance to damage. Whenever somebody wants something, the easier that you can discourage them from that goal, the weaker they are. It's why, and I really shouldn't be telling you guys this, but it's one of the reasons why for years with our Alliance Project, whenever I work with students personally, one-on-one, first I train them, then we partner together and build companies and do like real estate deals, do stuff together. Whenever somebody applies for that, it it takes a lot more than just having the money, by the way. And you can go to webuildempires.com and get all the details. But whenever somebody asks for an application, for years and years, what we do is we send them this email that basically tells them how difficult this is, how hard it is to get it going in their area. And by the way, we don't always know their area. We have no idea. You know, often we have no idea where they are. You know, we just know their email. Sometimes we have more information, but we don't even look at it. But we send out the same email either way. We say that in their area, it's difficult and that this is really hard to get going. They probably don't have what it takes, etc. And basically what I'm doing, what we do is I, I just try to discourage them. And I'll tell you something shocking about one half of the people who apply for the Alliance Project, who have the money and everything and want to get going, about one half of the people quit right there just after getting that first email that says this is going to be hard. Just after getting that first email, it's that easy to discourage them. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not doing that to be mean, by the way. I'm really saying because I know what it takes to make this happen. And if you are that easily discouraged, then you're going to be a nightmare of a student to work with. You know what I'm saying? So this is a really powerful way to start qualifying people. See how easy it is to discourage them. It's what's in their best interest. It's in their best interest to fight through that because most people conduct interviews or conduct training under ideal situations. And because of that, whenever people go out in the real world, they perform terribly because they've, they haven't really been trained under adverse situations. They get discouraged really easily. Now that you know that, now that you know this, now that you understand the power of you know understanding and measuring discouragement and how vulnerable somebody is to it, you should start using it in your qualifying and use it with yourself. Start getting stronger yourself. And you know, one of the reasons that I'm spending so much time talking about this is because even though I've heard this question from some people, I know that a lot more people have let this thought, this thought of quitting cross their mind. Or even worse, they don't actually decide or consider on it. They just let it fade away. Whatever they're doing, just, you know, their activity just fades away and days of inactivity turn into weeks. Weeks turn into months. Months turn into years. And soon after all that inactivity adds up, they don't even remember all the things that they passively quit. And to the younger people from overseas who may have found their way here, by the way, just a quick note to you, you guys are probably wondering what I've been talking about this whole time. Because you guys never dream of quitting or letting up. This is a problem that is almost entirely in America because quitting is a luxury that comes with comfort. That's why it's so much more prevalent here. And what makes all this worse is that there are some really simple ways that we've talked about on how to beat, how to to slay this demon through passion, skill, training, all that stuff. But ultimately, it does come down to how you deal with your problems. Whether you look at them as challenges to get past or problems to dwell on. A lot of times somebody will tell me about a problem or a list, you know, like a laundry list of problems. And the one thing you'll hear the LC often say is that I've tried everything. Those three words are like their, that's like their mantra. I've tried everything. And as a policy, whenever I hear that, I always say the same thing. Anybody on my team, actually all of us, we always say the same thing. Somebody says, I've tried everything. We always say, list the last 10 things that you tried. Or even better, list the last 10 things you tried and how you improved your approach with each one of them. And here's the thing that you'll find every time. In all the years that I've been doing this, nobody has ever had a list, had a ready list of 10 things that they did or 10 improvements that they made to each one of those things. The issue is that people generally don't try very many different things to solve their problems. They might try one or two or maybe three or four things, but they don't go crazy. And it's a simple problem. The best way to stop your problems from overwhelming you is to overwhelm them. So from now on, with any problem or challenge that comes up, immediately write the numbers one through 10 down and then go back and fill in each blank with an idea on how to deal with your issue. And really push yourself to come up with the answers. Remember, intelligence is the ability to make connections. This is how you make yourself get smarter. There's no problem in the world that somebody somewhere in history hasn't already solved. We just don't always make the connection. Remember in our class, uh, one of our classes, we talked about the Wright brothers and the mastery of flight and the first airplanes were made of materials that had been around for thousands of years, but nobody made the connection. So push yourself to make better connections. List 10 possible solutions. Find out, you know, find out, uh, find out who might have the answer or who would know somebody who has 
the answer. And when you make these 10 items, by the way, make sure that you can get them started and have some way to measure their effectiveness in the next 12 to 24 hours. One of our kids, Sabrina, came up with a name for this. It's called the 2410, and it's brilliant. And this concept, this 2410, it's really, really brilliant. Because within 24 hours, you look at the most effective idea that you had, the, the idea that had the most progress, that solved the problem the best, and you reinforce it. Then you look at the less effectiveness of the 10 ideas, and you fix them. You improve the approach. And then you, you know, come up with 10 more ideas, or 10 more, 20 more, 30 more. Go crazy. And that first list may take some time, but I train students on how to come up with that list in less than 60 to 90 seconds. That's how you want to move. Immediate, rapid execution. In general, your ability to develop or extract ideas and mold them into brilliance and then putting that brilliance into action, so developing brilliance and then getting it executed, those two things will solve any problem you ever have, any money problem you ever have. Those two things will solve any money problems that you ever have. And notice I said getting it executed instead of executing it yourself. That's a whole lesson on its own. We won't get into that right now. But when you start doing this, when you when you start going through this exercise, you'll develop bulletproof confidence. You'll always know that you can deal with anything that comes up. You'll have a concrete chin because you'll know that nothing will keep you down. This is how we also get, people always ask me how we get these kids to come up with such great ideas and to develop such brilliance and then execute it. And this is one way because anybody trained with my stuff can figure anything out. And we have them go through this 2410 constantly. They get smarter and smarter and smarter and they become different people. I mean, what's more profitable and more important than your ability to quickly solve problems, especially when you teach that to young people? What a gift you can give them. I mean, you see, you see how powerful this is, right? Also, if you're hearing this and you're thinking, oh, awesome, that's too much work. 10 things or more and going crazy, that's an overreaction. First, I'd say to you that if you lived your life solving your problems too fast or too aggressively, would that really be a problem? Would you rather have too many problems and not enough solutions or too many solutions and not enough problems? But on top of that, if you're thinking that this is too much work, then I would say that you're right. It is. So don't do it. Let somebody else do it while you become just another statistic. Most people won't do this. Most people won't do any of this. Most people will let their laziness convince them that fixing their problems is more painful than having them. Most people won't get what they want. So when somebody says something as stupid as that sounds like too much work, they are categorizing themselves. And they're right. It is. So don't do it. If you feel like that, don't do it. When people complain about work, I don't sit there and tell them that they're as wrong as bestiality, which any of my students will tell them that they are or that you are if you're thinking that. I don't do that though. I say the opposite. You're right. And that's exactly what your competitors think too. And that's why they're competing with you all on the same level. And by the way, if that's your thought process, you're not going to make a good student. So please don't apply. Most people are very creative in finding problems, not in solving them. Don't let problems, don't let challenges discourage you, discourage them. As you develop this, you'll develop a fearlessness and a skill that will immune you to market conditions, the economy, competition, pricing wars, online changes. You'll know that you and your team will always be able to figure it out. And in the process, never getting discouraged. Remember, most people quit. They don't just quit at some things. They quit at pretty much everything that they do. And they'll rationalize it and make it sound like it was a logical conclusion. And they'll always want to advertise their ignorance. You need to know better than that. And you need to know better than to listen to those mother grabbers. Don't do it. And it's not about being smarter than them or any kind of arrogance. You aren't better than them. You're just better trained. Make sense? Don't allow yourself to accept getting discouraged. It'll make a big difference in what you do. Okay, we got to wrap up. So finally, remember this. Momentum is one of the strongest forces in the world and it works both ways. Enforcing action and reinforcing inaction. Whenever you quit something, you feed a habit, train yourself, and add an extra burden of weight to start your next journey with. From now on, do not stop pursuing a goal until you get what you want. Arm yourself with willpower, emotion, and skill so that you ignore the temptations to quit or even to get discouraged. Okay, as always, you want to go to webuildempires.com if and when applications are being accepted, if you want to get trained personally, one-on-one when I work with students, webuildempires.com. Okay, thank you so much for everything. Talk soon.